Hello, I'm Jonathan Dean, Seattle Opera Dramaturg. Today's opera talk, The Operatic Life of Lorenzo da Ponte, is about someone who's very important to us opera supertitles personnel, the man who wrote the words, the librettos, for three of Mozart's greatest operas. Lorenzo da Ponte lived an astonishing life, starting out in what was basically medieval Italy and ending his days pretty much in modern urban America. Lorenzo da Ponte is the hero of the story I want to tell you, but not in, this, in the sense of protagonist. He was not a particularly heroic man. I'm certainly not suggesting that anyone take Lorenzo da Ponte as a role model. But there is one thing that I find quite admirable about him. He never gave up. If you have experienced any unpredictable turns of fortune of late, this is a story for you. Lorenzo de Ponte was not our protagonist's original name. When he was born, he was Emanuele Conigliano, Manny, the son of the rabbit catcher, poor Jewish child in a little hill town outside of Venice. This was 1749 when Manny was born. And in those days, you couldn't get very far as a Jew in the Republic of Venice. That's where the original ghetto was. In Venice, some Jews were wealthy and powerful, but they were segregated and had faced a lot of discrimination and anti-Semitism for centuries. Mr. Corneliano Sr. was not a wealthy and powerful Jew from Venice. He was a purveyor of rabbit skins, a worker in leather. Corneliano means conies. The boy was 14 when dad decided the whole family was going to convert that's when our hero became Lorenzo da Ponte, takes his name from the local bishop. Now, he could barely read or write. He was very bright, and they wanted him to get an education. And the only way to do that in this world was to sign up to become a priest. So our little Jewish boy enters Catholic seminary, learns Latin. He's introduced to the long and glorious tradition of vernacular language Italian poetry going back to Dante, becomes a total bookworm, and a poet. And along the way, somewhere, he became a priest. Not much of a priest. He was an abbe, what they call minor orders. What that really meant in the city of Venice, where he ended up a few years later, was that you weren't going to get married. So you could have a lot of fun. Venice in the late 18th century, they describe it sometimes as being in decline. Venice had been the capital of the world, Europe's gateway to the east a couple centuries earlier. But now, in the 1780s, it was basically Vegas. Everybody in Europe went to Venice for a really good time to blow a lot of money in a flamboyant way. And if you were a priest, like young Lorenzo da Ponte, who's now a teacher of Latin, Italian, and French, what that meant was lots of amorous engagements with all the alluring ladies of Venice. It was in Venice that Lorenzo da Ponte became acquainted with a notorious womanizer and adventurer named Giacomo Casanova. There's too many ladies to track them all in our short video, so I'm just going to tell you about three of the women in da Ponte's life. Actually, I'll let him tell you. I will read you three little passages from Lorenzo da Ponte's memoirs, written many years later when he was uh, living in America. Here's what de Ponte says about his first serious love affair. Unfortunately, I went to Venice. I was at the boiling point of youthful spirit, eager and lively by temperament, and as everyone said, attractive in person. I allowed myself through the customs and examples about me, as well as by my own inclinations, to be swept away into a life of voluptuousness and amusement, forgetting or neglecting literature and my studies almost entirely. I had conceived a very violent passion for one of the most beautiful, but at the same time, most capricious ladies of that metropolis. She occupied all my time in the usual follies and frivolities of love and jealousy, in convivialities, carousals, and debaucheries. Angela Tiepolo ended up being basically Lorenzo de Ponte's Manon Lescaut. 
For one thing, she had a rascally brother who was addicted to gambling and who bleated De Ponte until he was dry. Later, Tiepolo attempted to lure De Ponte to where another lover of hers was waiting to beat him. It wasn't, however, Angelo Tiepolo who got De Ponte exiled from Venice. In the end, he was run out of town be, by the city authorities, uh, largely because he had written some poems and had his students recite them, and they were critical of authority in a playful and satiric way. The Inquisition began following Lorenzo de Ponte. As I say, the Republic of Venice at this time was still pretty much medieval. The American Revolution had already begun. The French one was about to get going, but things were a lot slower to change in Italy. In the end, a husband whom de Ponte had cuckolded denounced the young poet. Uh, what you did was you slipped your anonymous accusation into the mouth of the lion statue, just like in the opera La Gioconda. And soon enough, Lorenzo de Ponte found himself on the lam. He thought maybe he could get a job in the theater through a buddy of his in Dresden, way up north. But that turned out to be a false trail. So he ended up relocating, and the next chapter of the Lorenzo de Ponte story takes place in Vienna, city of musicians. De Ponte showed up in this city with a letter of introduction to the Italian composer Antonio Salieri. Now, Italian opera had been a very big deal in Vienna for most of the 18th century. It was a very nice job. Caesarian poet to Her Majesty Empress Maria Theresa that had been held for decades by Pietro Metastasio, who was probably the most powerful and important librettist in the history of opera. There are literally thousands, maybe more, operas written to librettos by Metastasio. Don't worry, you haven't heard of any of them. But Metastasio was very old. De Ponte met him before he died, got his blessing, but he didn't get his job, which was, in fact, what he was after. Maria Theresa also died at that point. Her son, Joseph II, was the new emperor, reigned during Mozart's golden decade in Vienna. Joseph liked Lorenzo de Ponte, but he was a lot stingier than his mother. So, no, de Ponte did not become a rich man, although he kept pretty busy those years he was in Vienna writing opera librettos for Mozart and Salieri and all the other composers. He wrote for Mozart, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and then Così fan tutte, which we'll play on the radio coming up soon here. To me, Così fan tutte is the most Lorenzo de Ponte of all Lorenzo de Ponte texts. I should explain briefly what a librettist does. Some opera goers always seem to think that the libretto is written to the music instead of the other way around. The librettist writes the words first, and usually the composer then recites the words over and over until the music starts to take shape in the composer's mind. So the music is written second. But good librettists only write words that they know are going to inspire their composer. And of course, composer and librettist first agree on the outline, the structure of the show, who sings in an aria in scene three, how many characters are in the ensemble in act four. Together, they either work out the story or choose some pre-existing story that they want to make into an opera. For instance, The Marriage of Figaro one of the great masterpieces in all of opera, but all Mozart and Lorenzo de Ponte really did was to find a way to transform this fantastic French play into an Italian opera in a way that preserved much of its genius and hopefully did not offend. The politics of the marriage of Figaro are very liberal. They're with the revolution. They're up with the 99%. Mozart and de Ponte toned that down a little bit. I should also point out that they chose that subject partly because this French play by Beaumarchais was so notorious and famous, but also partly because Vienna had just enjoyed an opera on the prequel, the first Barber of Seville opera, not the one you know, that was written a generation later, but this Barber of Seville opera had played in Vienna, Mozart and de Ponte wanted to cash in on that show's popularity, well, we'll write part two. Figaro was enough of a success. They got a job the next year to write an opera, not for Vienna, but for Prague, which is not very far away. Uh, that's where their Don Giovanni was first performed. That opera really was just, what can we throw together really, really quick? 
because Don Giovanni had been a popular theater piece for centuries. Everybody knew it. It always worked. There was a mediocre Italian opera about Don Giovanni that had come out five years earlier, and Mozart and De Ponte figured they could do the same thing, only bigger and better. De Ponte stole a lot of that earlier opera, but he improved it beyond recognition. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. Unlike Figaro and Don Giovanni, Così Fan Tutte does not have a source in a pre-existing story. That's one of the reasons I say the opera has a lot more the spirit of Lorenzo de Ponte. Così Fan Tutte is a tricky piece. The libretto does come from the very long tradition of Italian poetry dealing with the game of love, seduction, and the chase. And I wouldn't call Così sarcastic necessarily, but at heart, it's ironic, maybe even cynical, about the concept of true love. True love, it's a bit like God. You can be a believer, or you can be an agnostic, or you can probably be a strict atheist. There is no such thing. I can't tell you exactly what Lorenzo de Ponte believed about either love or about God. He was a Catholic priest when he wrote these operas, but only out of necessity. In his memoirs, he never once mentions the fact that he was actually Jewish. I doubt he had any sincere religious convictions, but that's not to say he despaired. Indeed, as I said before, this is a man who never gave up. Now, love, or something resembling love, got Lorenzo de Ponte in trouble in Vienna, and it happened because of Così Fan Tutte. Actually, it happened because of the woman who created the lead soprano role in Così, Fior de Ligi. Her name was Adriana del Bene. In Vienna, where she was a big star soprano, they just called her La Ferrarese, the woman from the city of Ferrara. There's even an in-joke in Così about that. Here's what Lorenzo de Ponte said many years later about his Lady of Vienna. I have always, in general, been most susceptible to amorous passions. I nevertheless made it a very solemn rule of my life never to flirt with actresses. And for more than seven years, I had the strength to resist every temptation and observe my rule rigorously. But at last, to my misfortune, there came a singer who, without having great pretensions to beauty, delighted me first of all for her voice. And thereafter, she showing great propensity toward me, I ended by falling in love with her. But the lady had an impulsive, violent disposition, rather calculated to irritate the malevolent than to win and retain friendships let alone the envy of other singers she had angered too, especially. Sure enough, Adriana del Bene was despised by everybody in the Viennese opera scene. De Ponte, being her boy toy, always taking her side in various backstage intrigues and cabals, he too became very unpopular in that world. And then Joseph II died. The new emperor had zero interest in opera, didn't care a bit about Lorenzo de Ponte's poetry, was time to find a new scene. Mozart died around this time too, so no more collaboration there, even though de Ponte had urged Mozart to come to London with him. What was de Ponte doing in London? Well, there was another lady. But for Lorenzo de Ponte, third time was the charm. Love, or something like it, worked out quite well in the end, for our scoundrelly Jewish Catholic priest of Venice and poet of Vienna, de Ponte had been in Trieste, not far from Venice, when he met these charming young English sisters and became their Italian tutor. He was also trying to be a matchmaker and to set one of them up with a friend of his. But his friend was clearly interested only because the family had some money. The dad, another converted Jew, was a grocer and a moneylender. Lorenzo de Ponte was now about 40 years old. He was charming, still handsome, toothless now. An enemy of his in Vienna had tricked him into putting some goop all over his gums, and he lost all his teeth overnight. Anyways, he met Nancy Grahl. She's this British girl. And they moved to London, and suddenly they were husband and wife. Nobody in London knew that de Ponte was a Catholic priest, 
And indeed, if they did in fact have a wedding ceremony, there's a hypothesis that it may have been a Jewish wedding, her father having been Jewish and De Ponte having been born Jewish. So after writing all these operas about Don Giovanni and Count Almaviva and all these Casanova-like womanizers, the poet of seduction and misogyny enters willingly into the bonds of matrimony. Here's what Lorenzo de Ponte in his memoirs says about Nancy Graal. I did not even dare let it enter my head that she might be feeling any beginning of an attachment to me, and that not only because I was not less than 20 years her senior, but because I was poor, and she the daughter of a rich father with numbers of suitors who were aspiring to her, to her hand, all of them rich and very much younger than I. Both she and I were beginning to feel an indescribable something in our conversations, which inclined them to last somewhat longer than they usually do between friends and language students. However, she spoke no word of love to me nor I to her, but what lips did not say, affectionate glances, significant sighs, halting words, and above all, the need we felt of always being together and always at each other's sides, said eloquently enough. So Lorenzo de Ponte and Nancy moved to London, where he got a job with the Opera House. He also got hooked up with a little Italian bookshop connected to the Opera House. The theater was run at the time by an eccentric British opera lover, there's a lot of these in the history of opera in England, who was not very good at managing the company's finances. Neither was de Ponte. Great poet, a mediocre businessman. When the theater manager disappeared, Lorenzo de Ponte was somehow responsible for the bankruptcy of the theater and all its debts. He was actually about to be sent to debtor's prison, like in Charles Dickens. He avoided that fate by scooting off to the New World. He'd been banished from Venice, run out of Vienna, and now had to flee England. Off he went to that last refuge of all scoundrels, America. So chapter four of our story takes place in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Unlikely location, but that's where De Ponte's wife, Nancy, had some family. De Ponte sailed to Philadelphia, met up with his wife in New York, but she had family in this little village way out on the Susquehanna River, out on the frontier, not a bustling burg to compare with London or Vienna or Venice. And De Ponte lived there for several years, basically pushing a food cart, working for Nancy's family's grocery store. He was unable to make a profit. He didn't save a dime. We can only hope that the joys of being a husband and now a father, they had several children, compensated for what was probably a pretty dismal intellectual life. Eventually, when Lorenzo de Ponte couldn't take the suburbs anymore, he moved back to New York City. And his story continues. He had once gone into a bookshop in New York and loudly, in his not very good English, asked whether they had any Italian books. So he got into a lively conversation with the guy who ran the bookshop. A young man came over, attracted by all the commotion, introduced himself, and eventually became De Ponte's very good friend, Clement Clark Moore. You may remember Clement Clark Moore. He's the man who penned the words, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." Well, he was a member of the New York City Smart Set, circa 1805, I think this was, and his father was the president of Columbia University. So once Lorenzo de Ponte and Nancy had moved back to New York after their years in the wilderness, Clement Clark Moore hooked them up, and de Ponte became the first Italian professor at Columbia. His wife ran what was basically a finishing school for the young ladies of New York high society, taught them French, how to cook Italian cuisine. But De Ponte did not give up until there was opera in New York City. There was a very famous European family of singers headed by the tenor Manuel Garcia, Spanish tenor who created the role of Count Almaviva in Rossini's Barber of Seville in 1816. That's the Barber of Seville everybody knows. Garcia was a voice teacher as well as a tenor. He had trained his kids to sing. His daughters became Maria Malabran and Pauline Vialdo, two of the most important singers of the 19th century. So with their dad and the family troupe, there was a couple other members of the family who sang, they all sailed to New York City. Lorenzo de Ponte was their man on the ground, running around doing promotion. The pathetic part of the story, this is now 1825, he's in his 70s. 
Rossini's operas were all the rage. And De Ponte was like, oh, won't you sing an opera I wrote? Oh, look, I did this one with Mozart. And here's an even better one by Martini Soleil. To the end of his life, one of the things that's so bizarre about De Ponte, I don't think he ever really understood what he and Mozart had created. Obviously, he loved Mozart a lot, and I think the feeling was mutual, but he certainly didn't appreciate Mozart's operas the way we do today. De Ponte built the audience for those Manuel Garcia performances. They were a big success, although Garcia then lost all the money he'd made on that tour when bandits attacked him. He was on the road from Mexico City to Veracruz to sail back to Europe, lost all of his profits. His daughters went on to great success in Europe. De Ponte never gave up. He had whetted the appetites of New Yorkers for European opera, and now he helped to do the fundraising and to put together New York's first opera house, built a few years later. And then it, it burned down shortly after that. It was actually 40 years or so before the Metropolitan Opera came into existence. But the seeds had been planted. The appetite had been whetted in this city for this amazing art form. Yes. Little Jewish boy steps out of the pages of The Merchant of Venice and ends up igniting America's taste for the great tradition of European opera. We are all indebted to Lorenzo da Ponte for writing those three fantastic librettos, which inspired such great music in Mozart, but also for the lesson of da Ponte's life, which is pretty much the moral they all sing at the end of Così Fan Tutte. Just go with it. It's going to be a wild ride. Fortunato l'uom che prende ogni cosa pel buon verso. The main trick is to be able to see the positive in everything. The glass is half full. Land on your feet. Thank you for sticking with us here at Seattle Opera through this long period with no live opera. And please enjoy our radio rebroadcasts of great performances of our favorite operas, including Così Fan Tutte.